Uh, I want to talk about today video infrastructure and specifically uh, video server architectures for high quality, large scale, and multi point uh, uh, video. There has been a lot of developments over the last five, six years in this uh, area, and I think it is very important for people in this community to be uh, aware of them. And the, you know, there is always a danger when we're talking about APIs to think that just because you put an API around a problem, you solved the problem. So that is one example, right, that will probably be difficult to execute, even though I'll do my best here to, to, uh, to do service to that, uh, to that uh, uh, call. But before that, let's take a look at the history of, of uh, video servers because it will be very instructive. Now, in these presentations, I will be show showing a lot of video streams. And these streams, you know, they start from a video clip. You take uh, uh, every picture, you split it up, you code it, you put it into packets, you put the packets in a sequence, and that's how you create your, you know, RTP packet stream. And in this presentation, I'll be showing this as a series of packets. There is an associated image to show that this is video, and there is a name associated with, with the stream. So that's how we're going to be showing the, the streams. So at the center of the video server story is this multi-point conferencing um, unit, which started off in the early 90s and has been used, it's actually been used even to, uh, today. So in its very simplest form, you have a switching MCU where you have a number of incoming um, uh, streams, in this instance, I show three, and what the server uh, does, it just selects one and sends it to the output. So, you know, it picked one from the left and sent it to a receiving endpoint to the right. It didn't do any processing, so it's a very quick operation. There isn't much delay, but obviously there is very little flexibility in terms of what you do. You only see one participant, and that's about, uh, that's about it. The next level up is the mixing MCU, and this is something that was used in the days of H.261, early 90s in other words. And here you will receive, uh, in this example, four low resolution uh, streams. For example, they may be QCIF. And what the server will do is will actually copy paste data from those low resolution streams as components of a high resolution stream. So in the output, you'll have a composite of those four pictures. There wasn't much processing of the data except, again, from this copy-paste, and that's why you see the, the packets have you know, the same colors on the right as you have from, uh, from the left. So there is some delay here because of the composition that occurs on the server, but again, there's no uh, much uh, uh, processing. And of course, there is limited flexibility. Again, you will not see any of the participants in high resolution, right? All the participants will be in low resolution. In the third level up, you have what's called a transcoding MCU. And this has been the state of the art up until 2008. In the transcoding MCU case, what happens is that the, the server will receive, in this example, four compressed streams. It will decode them. It will scale the video, recompose them as a, uh, as a new image, and then re-encode that to transmit it to the participant. So you can see in this example, there is a totally new stream of the output, you know, the red color to the, to the right, and it has an arbitrary layout. Now, this is the most flexible design because, you know, the, 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 the MCU can do whatever it wants in terms of composition, but on the other hand, it's computationally extremely expensive because you have to do all those different decodes and re-encodes for each and every participant. But worse of all is the delay. Okay, uh, regardless of how much processing you throw at the MCU, the fact that it has to do these processing steps introduces delay. And because this is supposed to be used for human communication, delay is extremely important. You want to stay well below 180 milliseconds. And in practice, in commercial MCUs, delays of 150 to 200 milliseconds input to output are fairly typical. And that excludes any transport delay, any encoding, decoding delay. So you're already way beyond what would be acceptable for you know, interactive communication. And that has been a huge detriment for the adoption of multi-point video. Okay? It's just very annoying. So uh, that has been the state of the art up until 2008. And at that point, uh, video threw an exception to the system. And that exception was SVC. 
scalable video coding, which is part of H.264. Now, what as we see does is uh, encode video in a, in a way that uh, uh, is composed out of layers. In traditional single layer coding, the compression is done by taking the individual pictures and coding them as a chain, where each picture depends on the immediately previous one, where it is used as a reference. So this is a chain, and if you break the chain, it collapses, right? That's why with traditional single layer coding, whenever you would exceed two and three pa three percent packet loss rates, the quality will be will be awful. And that's why when people move from ISDN and T1 lines in video conferencing to the internet, right, they realize this is not working. And then you have to use overlay networks and you that you pay extra. Why? Because the network could not, you know, uh, uh, have more than three, four percent packet loss, right? Because it would be completely detrimental to the quality of the of the video. With scalable coding, and uh, the first example also is temporal scalability. What you do is you you take in this example one every four uh, pictures to construct a, a first layer, a base layer that you will compress as before as a chain. But then you will construct additional layers by taking the intervening pictures. Uh, for example, if you take every two pictures, that will be a second layer. Now you went from seven and a half frames per second to 15 frames per second, and you can continue that to add a third layer that would add another 15 uh, frames per second for a total of 30. So you create this hierarchy of uh, temporal layers that allow you to go up and down in operating between seven and a half, 15, and 30 frames per second. And of course, if your top is 60, you can do the math to see the, to see the, uh, the difference. You can also do it in the spatial dimension. So meaning in terms of resolution, you start off with a high resolution picture that you scale down, and then you can encode the low resolution picture, use it as a reference for the high resolution, and this way you create essentially two layers, uh, the, a base uh, layer and an enhancement layer, that you would then put together in a multiplex and transmit. If it, yes. Okay, so that's what the specially scalable stream would uh, look like. And it offers you, again, both special resolutions in the same stream as well as the temporal resolutions. So what are the pros and cons in doing that? Well, you have some overhead, about 20% versus single layer, but what you get in return is superb error resilience. This can take more than 20% packet loss rate in burst mode, okay? Uh, which is hugely important when you want to run video right on on the public internet. And the reason why this works is because the, because of the temporal scalability first, and because with special scalability you have a lot of anchor points to to save yourself if something goes wrong. A, a parallel to this is is four wheel drive, where it consumes more gas, right? But it provides tremendous safety. So on an icy road, you are better off spending the 20% more for gas rather than risking totaling your car, right? So that's kind of the idea. Now, the third piece here is adaptability. Hugely important, again, on the internet, because if there is any, if there is any standard in, uh, on the net, is variation, right? Nothing stays the same for long. Now, scalability is already in H.264. Obviously, SVC is part of H.264. But it's also, pre it's also part of BP-8, temporal scalability, as well as the new codec H.265 or HCVC, high efficiency video coding. Uh, again, in terms of temporal scalability. It will also be available in the scalable version of HCVC, which is coming out next month. There is a meeting in Sapporo that will ratify uh, this new version of HCVC. And as you know, we have announced, video has announced uh, that we're working with Google to develop scalability uh, capabilities for VP9. And I'll, I'll say a few, few more things in my presentation later um, today. Now, the reason why video introdu introduced scalable video coding in the video conferencing industry was actually because we wanted to introduce a new type of server. And we call that, vid that server the video router. And how does that work? The router gets a number of streams at the input. I saw three here that are scalably coded, so each one has a base and an enhancement la layer, right? And what the video router does, it just selects 
which packets from which layer to forward to any particular receiver. In this example, it transmits full resolution for the blue participant, uh, but only base layer for the green and, uh, and the yellow. Why? Because the available bitrate said so, because the receiver wanted to see the blue participant in big resolution, because there wasn't enough screen real estate to show the green and yellow participants in full resolution, any number of reasons. It does not matter, right? The router will take whatever uh, uh, information is available and make that decision. So, as you can imagine, this is a very simple operation. You know, there's no processing to be done on the video. And more importantly, there is no delay. There is very little delay. We're talking about less than 20 milliseconds spent, right, from the input to the, to the output. So that's a huge, huge uh, uh, advantage. Now, what's interesting, it's also what happens on the receiving end, on the endpoint side. On the endpoint side, you have to receive multiple streams of video, right? Decode them and do the composition yourself. Well, if you think about it, that's exactly how the web browser works, right? The web browser will get content from the web server. It will decode, you know, it's JPEG or GIF or whatever, uh, render and composite it, you know, on your local computer. Imagine what the web would be if the web server had to do the rendering of the pages. We could never get to the size and the scale of the web where we are today. So that's a hard earned lesson on the internet that you have to push the complexity towards the edge. Well, in video conferencing, that lesson is only now being digested. Okay? So uh, I think that's a very key distinction. And of course, it's a perfect match for WebRTC, which is inherently multi-stream, right? And where it can actually do the composition on the web browser, okay? So what did we gain overall? We have all the high-end features of, of top-of-the-line video conferencing systems like error resilience, right, again, because of scalability, rate matching, you can adapt the video to whatever available bitrate exists, you know, is available on the, connection from an endpoint to a server or from a server to an endpoint. You have personalized layout. Each participant can decide what they want to see and, and where exactly, right? Obviously, the low delay. Error localization is also very important in that if there is a problem between two components of a system, that will not affect the quality of any other component. In the old days, if you, lose, if you lost a packet, you had to send, oh, send me an intra picture, like, and that would affect everybody who participated in the conference because that intra picture will have to be transmitted to all the receivers. Not so when you use scalable video coding. And the last two, low complexity and cascading, are extremely important for large scale deployments. Now, cascading is possible. Why? Because you have very low delay on, the, on, the, on that server, right? So you can actually have more than one in a sequence without killing your end-to-end -end delay uh, properties you know, of your system. You could not do that with a transcoding MCU. And again, all that with no signal processing at the server, right? So that makes the video server uh, similar to any other sort of network appliance that you have in your you know, IT closet. In the past, the video server will be more expensive than all your networking gear combined, right? Not so anymore with this architecture. Now, simulcasting is an alternative uh, technique to scalable uh, uh, video coding. And in this case, what happens is that you take your video, you get a low-resolution version of it, and you encode them separately. Okay, so you still have two resolutions, but the drawback is you have to pay more in terms of bitrate overhead. This is 50% more than single layer and about 20, 25% more than uh, SVC, right? So you have to pay a price, and in fact, you have to pay the price on a difficult part of the communication path, which is from the endpoint to the server, okay? What you get in return is that, you know, both layers are sort of compatible with the video coding standard that you are using. So if you have a legacy deployment, let's say of H.264 single layer in you know, AVC uh, uh, hardware, that makes sense, okay? So some, you know, some people are using that. Now, the interesting thing is that in the, in the standards world, in the ITF, there was no term for these architectures, not for the video router, which is what you know, video is, is providing, nor for the version with a, with a simulcast. So I coined the term selective forwarding unit 
uh, uh, back in the fall. And I think now this is being used in the in the uh, RTP topologies uh, uh, draft uh, update. And uh, I think that's very good because now we have, a, we have a term for this concept that, again, did not exist when the, when the uh, original you know, RTP standards were put in, uh, were put in place. Okay? Uh, now, video has developed a large product portfolio with this. So, so at the center is obviously the video router and the video portal that does user management. right? And on the left-hand side, you see equipment that you know, is used on-prem, on-premises. And that will be the video router. There will be a video gateway that will allow you to communicate to legacy devices like H.323 or C pen points. Okay, so it would do transcoding. There is a video replay device to record and stream video conferences. And on the endpoint side, we have video desktop that runs you know, on all popular operating systems for, for desktops, video room. Uh, which is you know, for conference rooms, and the video panorama, which is essentially a room with, that allows you to have you know, like up to six very large uh, uh, monitors. And on the right-hand side, you can see the video router VE and video gateway v VE, which are the virtual editions of these devices. Obviously, architecturally, the video router is a perfect match for a, for a cloud right, deployment, just because, again, no signal processing. Okay? So, uh, it's interesting to see uh, where some of this infrastructure has been used. I don't know if you can recognize this picture. You know, we think we do some serious engineering. Well, I think that's, you know, that's probably the, the most impressive piece of engineering of our day. To get perspective, there is a map, oops, sorry. There is a, there is a man at the bottom of the picture, just to get the perception of you know, the size of it. So this is actually a part of a large hadron collider which is uh, located at uh, CERN in, in Switzerland, okay? And uh, CERN has been a video customer for, for a number of years. They switched their entire video communication to use uh, video. And they have a pretty impressive deployment. They have 18,000 users. They have 800 to 1,600 simultaneous connections. Uh, they have up to 168 simultaneous 3 to 3 or SIP connections. They have 12 phone access points worldwide. They have two video panoramas at the CERN facility. And they can do up to 12 simultaneous recordings. And you know, we all know that CERN is located in Switzerland. But in actual fact, uh, they, they have collaborators all over the world. In fact, it's typical that experiments have hundreds and even thousands of collaborators. So. If you look at their worldwide service topology, right, what you will see is that you know, they have a bunch of stuff located at their headquarters, including their, uh, their portals. Uh, but they have positioned routers throughout the world, as well as gateways, gateways and phone access uh, 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 devices. So you can dial into a conference using you know, uh, PSTN. So this is a very exciting deployment right, that shows you know, how much this can, uh, uh, can scale. Now, early on at video, we realized that this architecture is what is necessary to allow video to become ubiquitous. Because again, it, it switches the complexity around by pushing it to the edges. So we designed the system to be based on a, on a set of SDKs, the Video Works SDK. Okay? And then we provided a set of APIs on top of that to allow people to develop their own custom applications. Because what we've seen is this. In the beginning, with video conferencing, you had room systems. Then we went to UC, unified communications. And you had smartphones, tablets, and desktops. But then what happens with, uh, by providing the SDK and the APIs, we allowed people to take video and integrate it in completely new applications. So for example, Nintendo took it and put it in Wii U, right? Um, Philips took it and put it in the EICU. Okay, I guess Google Hangouts will be another example. So by making that set of SDKs and APIs available, people were able to take this and use it effectively in their applications. Why? Because this new architecture made it possible. Okay, whereas the old Iron uh, did not. So we are moving now away from video applications 
to something that we should probably call applications with video, right? So you can actually integrate video to uh, third-party applications. And of course, that's what WebRTC is all about. So you will ask, okay, what does video do with WebRTC? How do we bring WebRTC into this, into this system? Well, the way we do it is as follows. Uh, starting off from the core VideoWorks infrastructure, uh, we have the VideoWorks platform that includes the router, the portal, the gateway, and the APIs. We also have a native VideoWorks web plugin for all the browsers. Okay, so that's something that video develops. It's not WebRTC. That uses SVC to communicate with the, with the platform and has its own signaling to, to talk from the uh, browser plugin to that uh, to the platform devices. There is a JavaScript API right on the plugin side, and there is a Web Services API on the on the portal side. With that, third-party developers can develop their applications both on the server and on the client side. So the green stuff is something that video defines. The yellow stuff is what the application developer creates. Okay, so that's all on the video side. Now, how does this work? with WebRTC. We start off with a vanilla WebRTC implementation, and we provide a component on the server that uh, interacts with WebRTC. So it can take VP8 from the WebRTC uh, client, and it will transcode to SVC and backwards, right? So you can transmit SVC video to the WebRTC client. We also develop a VideoWorks WebRTC JavaScript library that sits on top of WebRTC, and take care of all the signaling that has to go on between the client device and the video works platform. And of course, we define a JavaScript API, similar and identical to the one that we had on the, the video plugin, that allows a developer to, uh, uh, to use that. Okay? And I'm, I'm pleased to be able to announce today that this will be available to developers in September 2014. So that will allow uh, 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 developers to create WebRTC clients that can talk to the video uh, infrastructure. Okay. Now, another thing that people ask uh, often is about scalable VP9. And uh, as I mentioned, we, we announced with Google that we are developing scalable extensions to VP9. And uh, I think that's a great, uh, a great step forward because by doing so, we will be able to take all those uh, developments that I talked about regarding the server architecture and incorporating in the WebRTC uh, environment in a native way. So I'm very pleased to show you today the first ever preview of scalable VP9. And what I'm going to show you uh, is uh, 1080p at 60 frames per second with three temporal layers and three spatial layers using two to one spatial scalability. So 1080 and then over two and again over two. And this at rates of 840, 350, and 125 kilobits per second. Again, 1080p at uh, 30, 60 frames per second. So. If we can, one second. If we can switch to the video, please. Okay. So that again is is again scalable VP9 at uh, 840, 350, and 125. Now this is scaled obviously to fit everything in a single frame, right? And it's also there is also processing involved because of you know going from my laptop which is running uncompressed video, just so there are no artifacts, but it has to go through HDMI, you know, through to the projectors, etc. But it's pretty, you know, the quality is extremely good, and again, it's 1080p at 60, which at below one megabit, it's, uh, it's, it's extremely high quality. And I think beyond, again, beyond the mere uh, concept of uh, compression efficiency, I think what's most important is the availability of scalability, because that's what unlocks all the different features that I mentioned before, the error resilience, the ability to use this selective forwarding architecture, uh, and all that. 
All right. So um, uh, if if you want, I'll, I have the actual video. You can see it on the on the laptop. So if, if we could switch back to the. Good. So, so again, we're not making an announcement when this will be available, uh, but uh, I, you know, I think it's a, it's a very exciting development for the future of uh, of WebRTC. And you know, Serge mentioned in the morning uh, all the tools, you know, NV, VAT, Vic that we're using in the early days of the internet. In fact, I was a PhD student myself between 1990 and 95, right? And I've seen all these things myself, you know, in the beginning. So. We certainly came a long way since, uh, since, then, since then, and I think we also broke uh, a, a lot of barriers, and we made you know, huge, I think, progress in terms of being able to offer you know, high-quality video in, in all those different devices that we have. So I'm very optimistic about WebRTC, and I, I look forward to even more innovation for the years to, to come. Thank you very much.